Hello, and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this webisode, we are now to 51, can you believe it, 51 webisodes. So this is exciting how we're building this library of really interesting individuals throughout the world in discussing arbitration. And in this webisode, we're going to be talking to a leader and expert in labor arbitration and employment arbitration in South Africa. And her name is Tanya Venter. And Tanya Venter is the CEO of Tokitho, which is a dispute resolution corporation in South Africa. So Tanya, first of all, thank you so much for taking your time today with us. Thanks, Tammy. Yeah. And being our 51 episode, can you believe it? That's so exciting that we've reached this <laughs> milestone. <laughs> well, I want to start off with asking you about the name. Um, what made you come up with the name Tokiso? And if you could maybe explain that to everyone. Yes, a pleasure. Tokiso um, is a Sesotho word, which is one of the South African, one of the 11 South African languages, and it means fix it up. So it's, uh, it says fix it up, so it is what it is. And it was actually chosen by an employee when we first started the organization almost 20 years ago. And they won a competition and we adopted the name. And so our full name is Tokiso Dispute Settlement, which says fix it up, dispute settlement, <laughs> really. Isn't that perfect though? I mean, it really yeah. is. I love that name. Yeah, because we want to be problem solvers, right? And fix it up couldn't be more perfect for the yes. name of a corporation that seeks to solve problems. <laughs> yeah, and that's so, what we do is we try and find a solution and that's how we base it. Um, and sometimes cases can be very complex. Um, yeah, so, so we do a wide range of kinds of disputes and a lot of them are employment and labor matters. So, and speaking specifically about workplace dispute resolution, how does South Africa deal with discrimination cases, especially considering apartheid and the history of South Africa? Yeah, yeah and, and I think South Africa has a unique way of looking at it, but also one which I think could be of guidance at the same time, because it's so front of mind in everything we do, because of the history of apartheid. Um, and the first, I do want to make some backdrop comments, if I may, around South African society is we're 26 years into democracy. Uh, and interestingly, um, although we don't have statistics, um, very much like the states, our statistics are not always particularly good. Our courts are not good at keeping these. Um, but certainly anecdotally, I can confirm that we have seen an uptick in the number of discrimination cases coming through our courts and our dispute resolution tribunals. Um, and they, they're wide ranging, but curiously, specifically racism and sexual harassment. And in our law, sexual harassment is deemed to be a form or it's, uh, it's um, in our statute that it's a form of discrimination. So those are the two majority coming through, but there's other forms of discrimination that are certainly we are seeing as well. Um, South Africa is a constitutional democracy, so obviously in 1994, when we had our democracy introduced, we, we've got a very progressive constitution that, um, that recognizes equality um, before the law, and um, the, the principle of dignity um, is probably the one um, um, right um, that, that um, seems to prevail in our constitutional court. And we have a constitutional court, which obviously is our highest court of our land. So just that that is a context, um, our constitution is there and there's been um, a couple of pieces of legislation enacted. There's one that's a generic one called uh, the promotion of equality and prevention of dispute resolution, of, of, of unfair discrimination. But the one specific to workplaces, our Employment Equity Act, which very, if I may very broadly state is, has got two tiers to it. Broadly, that's to prevent um, and prohibit discrimination, but also to put in proactive steps to, to correct uh, corrective measures for the past, which is largely, largely your affirmative action um, um, legislation. So, it's, it's, so you've got those two pieces to your, to your workplace. Interestingly, the workplace discrimination was introduced in 1998. The generic one was 2000. So, um, and it's just interesting to note that um, because our union movement played such a pivotal role in the shift of our society towards democracy, the work, our suite of labor laws were one of the first pieces of legislation enacted um, after democracy. I just so thought that was 
Yeah, that yeah. is it's interesting. Well, and it makes sense because work is yeah. so central to dignity. And I wonder how does arbitration fit into this mix of laws? Okay, well, I think the, the way that arbitration in, in our labor law, uh, we've got a, unlike the states, uh, where we have protected um, uh, protections against dismissal um, in, uh, in our legislation, where they've established specialist courts, being your labor courts, and you also have a tribunal called the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration. And there's also um, industry bodies called bargaining councils who, and the CCMA, the Commission and the bargaining councils, um, are, can mediate or conciliate um, or disputes, have to go through some means of trying to settle through conciliation. And if it's not settled, it can go, it must go to adjudication, be in arbitration or the labor courts. So, so there's a very clear, distinct way and it's been enacted. So just to give you an idea, um, the CCMA, the commission, here's 200, this year we'll probably hear 200,000 cases. Just to give you a nice wow. sense of how big it is. The bargaining councils probably have between 30 and 40,000 cases um, between them. So it's, it's enormous. Um, the majority of our cases are unfair dismissal cases and discrimination cases that are referred directly are actually in the minority. But discrimination, we, it, it can be found in other areas, for example, automatically unfair dismissals. You find that discrimination also rears its heads there, where um, obviously you've, you've got unfair dismissals for um, things like misconduct. But if you dismiss somebody for for, for discrimination, for example, for being pregnant or being black or being a woman or joining a union, that would be deemed to be discriminatory and fall into the category of automatically unfair dismissal. So there's a lot of protectionisms that are created around discrimination and arbitration and adjudication is the means in which it's resolved. So, well, and so, so as an arbitration company, so with Tokiso, do you end up like how many cases do you end up arbitrating in a given year? Sure, we, we do thousands of cases. Um, we we known as a private agency, so we accredited by the uh, by the commission, and so you have your th there's three categories in which you can go to. You can go to the commission, you can go to your bargaining council, or you can come to Tokiso as the largest private agency. So we do thousands of cases a, a year. So um, it, it, we do a much more broader variety because we, because we are a private agency, um, we often hear cases, the scope in which we can hear a matter can be privately be determined by the parties. So the one benefit is that if there is no agreement between the parties of how the dispute is to be resolved, you go to your commission, but if the parties have a predetermined clause in the agreement, they can still access private arbitration, which would be like through Tokiso. So it's, 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 the system creates flexibility, which is very beneficial to parties. So do they pay a different amount then as far as a filing fee if yes. they go to private versus the commission? Yes, and that's one of the disadvantages of private. Interestingly, um, you have a filing fee in, in the, uh, as part of your court system in the States, as I know they do in Britain and various other jurisdictions. South Africa does not have a filing fee at all in its courts. In fact, our courts are free of charge. Um, there's no, it does not attract any fee. And our, the commission has the same system in that it's a free service. And it's got no bars to it. So there's no stamp duty, no, no filing fee, et cetera, that's required. Any party can go to this commission directly and it will, the matter will be heard free of charge. Um, to Kiso, on the contrary, we charge a fee and it is not free. Um, that's one of the downsides. But the benefits are that you can determine your own scope, jurisdiction, it's private, it's more confidential, and um, you can choose your arbitrator. So some parties prefer having that kind of um, predetermined and pre uh, and and self determination, if I can call it that, of their matters. Yeah. So what about now? We talked a lot about discrimination cases um, and the and the protections that are in place. Is that the same as a racism case, or how how is that addressed? Okay. Well, it's quite interesting. Our, our courts have been quite um, well. You can imagine is like I said, there's been an uptick in cases, and I'm. Um, it's interesting that 
The issue of racism only came before our constitutional court of what is, what, how do you define racism? Only came before our constitutional court in 2018. So this is like very recent. And it was a lovely case. Um, and maybe that's what I, if you, if you want, Amy, I can take you through how that test works. And it's very much helped arbitrators determine racist, racism matters coming before them. Is that um, essentially this was a case on a mine at Rustenburg Platinum Mine, which is one of the big mines in South Africa. It's a very big mining country, of course. And what transpired in this matter is that there was um, a mine, a supervisor level, a manager, who had parked uh, his vehicle. And if you, if you can visually imagine mines, they drive these huge pickup, what you refer to as pickup trucks, and they have to reverse park them. So you can imagine quite, quite um, big car vehicles. And what would happen is there was a parking dispute. There was a, a, this guy, this manager had parked his vehicle and um, he had seen that the guy who had licked him had parked a little bit in his space. And he was very angry about this because they're two large vehicles and he had struggled to park. And he had raised this with the person who was in charge of the parking before and complained about the way that the other manager was parking. And essentially the crux of it is this, the manager that was complaining about the parking was white and the other, other parker was a black, um, another black supervisor manager person. And this happened again. And he, this manager, this white manager got very, very angry and walked into a meeting or is alleged to have walked into a meeting at that point and said in Afrikaans, which basically means um, that, uh, move that black man's vehicle. Now, um, he, the, so this is what he was brought before a disciplinary hearing for firstly um, disrupting a safety meeting and secondly for using the term black man, okay, and he was dismissed on that basis for disrupting the safety meeting and for racist terminology. It went to the commission to adjudicate or arbitrate and the commission found that the dismissal was unfair that the term Swartman or black man did not, was not necessarily racist in nature. And they in fact found that it was an unfair dismissal and reinstated the manager. The, the mine took it to the labor court who then overturned that decision. Um, I don't, I'm gonna shorten it very quickly to get the court, went to the labor appeal court and who then overturned the labor court's decision. You can see how many times it went. And it then went to the constitutional court now, the Constitutional Court heard this matter and said, um, actually ended up agreeing with the test used in the appeal court. And this was essentially the test that they used. They said, the correct test to determine racism is that you need to look at the context of South Africa as a country and the history. You cannot look in isolation of the history of South Africa at, at issues such as race. There's no such thing as neutrality. However, the test for racism is an objective one in that uh, the question is looking at um, the, the, when that comment was made, looking at the facts objectively in the, and with all the actual facts of the case, understanding all of the facts, would a reasonable person receive that comment as racist? Okay, so that's the first part of the test. Um, it's an objective test, but with a bit of a subjective background on the context of the country. The second part of the test is then that, and the onus there would, would obviously be on the company. Then the second part of the test would be, would, um, was the intent racist? And then that would be for the employee to show um, whether it was to argue and to show that it was not intended not to be racist. So it's a two-step approach, which is enormously success, enormously helpful. Now, taking the facts of, um, of the, mis, this, this manager, Mr. Bester, into account, how was that applied? Um, Mr. Bester, what I do need to say is Mr. Bester argued that he did not make that comment. He denied making that comment. So how the court applied it was they said to him, they said, well, objectively and looking at the facts of the case, all the evidence points that he did make the comment. There were a lot of witnesses that said he did make the comment, so they have to find that he made the comment. 
And considering the context and the history of the country, it, could, it is reasonably received as racist and re having a racist and derogatory. The second test was, was it intended to be racist? Now, the court looked at it and said, well, the manager never ever argued that he never intended it to be racist. That was not his evidence. And on that basis, he has not dis discharged his onus and therefore it has to be assumed that, that the intent was racist and therefore he was found to be guilty, correctly guilty of racism and correctly dismissed. So does that make sense? It's, it's a fascinating and a very coherent, concise test in my view. So arbitrators then have the power within these arbitrations and if they're part of the commission um, to make that determination. Yes. So I, I've done several cases now involving racism and I've used that test. And it's enormously helpful because it's created. Um, so when, when, be it at the commission, be it in a private arbitration, we now obliged to follow the constitutional court test and we follow that, that diligently. And it's very much helped in providing guidance to arbitrators on how to test for, um, um, for racism. Interestingly, um, we, we sit with the problem, and I see, I see with your courts, you have the same issues that um, we all human beings with our backdrop of, of our own prejudices. Mm -hmm. um, and it, we often find that um, your, your profile um, comes with, um, what could I say, people have preconceived ideas on how you're going to judge based on your profile. So you tend to think that white arbitrators are going to have a particular view versus a black arbitrator. So it's quite interesting to see having this test, I think will certainly take away that it's provided a guidance that, that directs your, your way of thinking away from the fact of your, the profile of the arbitrator. So if you, if you use the test effectively as an arbitrator, I tend to find you come to the right decision, no matter what your profile. I would think, though, that you still have to pay um, diligent attention to having diverse panels of arbitrators, um, because otherwise, um, you know, implicit bias exists. And so yes. I would think that that's very important as well as making sure to promote diversity in the panels. Yes. So in, in South Africa, we are obliged to have a, a, re, a, a representative panel. Uh, and so that's the first thing. Um, what we also do in is arbitrate, uh, arbitrators, we have seen a massive shift in the way that, that arbitrators are being appointed. And I think like in the States, um, the practice of, arbitrator, of arbitration has historically been the purview, almost the exclusive purview of older white men. We've seen that shift dramatically in the last 10 years. And in fact, we've created a, um, a Tukiso, um, unlike the commission, where they actually appoint your arbitrator on your behalf. So you, like a judge system, you don't have any say. One of the challenges we had was getting parties to agree arbitrators, or there being a concern that the tribunals, like Tukiso, a private arbitration tribunal, would um, influence who got chosen as the arbitrator. And we've actually put in very, very stringent tests, um, systems to enable the parties to choose their own arbitrators in a much more effective way. And interestingly, what we've seen by creating that mechanism, we have seen a massive shift to using much more black and women arbitrators by choice of the parties. Because we're no longer the gatekeeper of determining who gets work. It's in fact the parties that are seeking out better representativity. Oh, I don't know if that makes right. sense. Well, that's good because we still have a lot of trouble um, with international arbitration and here in the US um, trying to promote diversity because some parties tend to always go to the same um, arbitrators who have been around for a very long time and they tend to be um, white men. So, yeah. so there's still a challenge there that remains. We find that that's, in my experience, and this is only anecdotal, of course, is um, in the commercial field, we still see that, in the international arbitration field, yes. But in the labor field, I would say well over, I would say about 80% of the cases we do in the labor field and the employment field are done by probably black, um, black arbitrators. Wow, well, that's great. I mean, it's good to hear um, all of the sort of movement and the progression um, 
and yeah. all, everything has happened in really a relatively short period of time, if you think about yes. it. Um, it's really not that Very long. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Tanya, this has been really interesting, very, very informative. Thank you for sharing your information, experience, and expertise. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you Have so much. Thank you. Have a great evening.